Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way next, Off 90. A toast to the history of beer in Winona. A short sketch about a pencil artist. An observation of Owatonna. And Jack and Kitty get on the train. It's all coming up on your next stop, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this trip, Off 90. The people of Winona take their beer seriously. Soon after the city was founded, they had a brewery, which opened before Winona's lumber mill. We went to Winona to find out about its beer heritage and how under the influence of that heritage, the people of Winona are today. Bottoms up. This is my bartender bracelet. So if I ever am in a bar and too drunk to remember what to, what to order, I can just show them this and they'll, they'll bring me a beer. I, I like beer because it tastes good, it's nourishing, and uh, there's so many varieties. In pre-Civil War America, you needed five ingredients to, to make to brew beer. And that was water, grain, hops, yeast, and German immigrants. And Minnesota had all five. So it's really not surprising that, we, that Winona had a brewery even before they had a flour mill. In 1855, the first, the first uh, brewery opened. The first brewery started in 1855 as Gilmore Valley Brewing and then evolved into Beck's Brewery. And as was common with, with a lot of these breweries, it burned down. Fire was real common all, all over in that era. And um, some, went, some were rebuilt, some just weren't. Peter Boop, and, and, and the reason it's pronounced that way is because he was a Bavarian immigrant. And um, he actually didn't found the brewery that wound up being Boop's. He, um, he well, he came from, from um, uh, what was then the best brewing, uh, Philip Best Brewing in Milwaukee, which l later became P Pabst. He came from there to Winona and was manager for a guy who founded the brewery named Jacob Weisbrot. And in 1871, Weisbrot died and within mo a couple months, uh, Peter Boop, his manager, married a twit, married Vice Brod's widow and took over the business and then the next year it burned down uh, and we, we speculated that maybe it was the ghost of Vice Brod that <laughs> caused the fire. After he re Peter Boop rebuilt, it was a, he called it Peter Boop's Sugarloaf Brewery and it, it, that's because it's located right right below the Sugar Loaf Mountain here in Winona. And the advantage of that location is that they had a series of, of tunnels in the caves, and that's a perfect place for aging beer. Transportation was pretty limited, and refrigeration was not very good. So the, 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 the biggest growth in brewery prior to the craft beer renaissance um, occurred when all these regional, regional new developments as the West was, was being uh, settled, everybody had to, would get their own brewery. So what your, what your ancestry was determine your taste. And so there were all these styles. Uh, the, Belgian, the Belgian ales tended to be more sour. You've got your Pilsners, you've got your, your and, and, and Boops was essentially a, a Pilsner. That, that, was, that was their flagship beer.
India Pale Ale is, was called that because it was brewed in, in England to make the, the trip all the way to India. And so it, that, that called for a stronger beer. So the, the, the IPAs tend to be pretty, pretty hoppy, and they also tend to be pretty high alcohol content. This is Jerry Kulas, and he was the last surviving member of the old Boops, Boops Brew Crew. He worked with the Island City Group and was very much into beer. And he had, he had all the recipes from Boops. And they got their Pilsner from working with him. And they call it Pool 6 Pilsner. And it's, it's as close as you're gonna find to the old Boops recipe. And that's what Boops Brew Pub has, has on tap. Personally, I got involved with craft beer at home. So it was something that I could do for fun, you know. Brew yep. up some beer at home. Also, I was you know, just out of college, so I was poor. It's something I could, I could make an IPA after you buy all the equipment for roughly 50 cents, a, you know, a bottle. So I could drink really good beer for cheap, plus then it's something you could show up to a party with and it, you made that. It's a good thing to share with your friends. No, I mean, yeah. Yeah. otherwise you're drinking at home by yeah. yourself. <laughs> When I was growing up, it was in the era when you could get lager, lager, or lager, and you got it from all the usual suspects. So right. for me, it's like this is the golden age of craft brewing, yeah. and I'm enjoying every drop. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Going to a brewery and, and, and drinking beer that was made by your neighbor, who yeah, right. Doug is my neighbor, um, <laughs> is, is really just a cool thing. And the, the taste is, it, it's unique and um, every different beer you have can be a different experience. In 2018, we were right around 700 barrels. Um, I would say this brewery's capacity is somewhere closer to 3,500 barrels. Um, so we still have a ways to go. We can grow in the space, which is encouraging. We don't have to add on to make more beer. We're moving beer in, I would say, pretty much an hour radius of Winona. Um, so we're talking Eau Claire, La Crosse, um, Rochester, you know, Lanesboro, those are areas. Um, and we just started venturing up into the Twin Cities area, so. Ultimately, I mean, we're going to be around for a while, and that's going to be a part of the history of Winona, that we have a brewery from 2017 until forever, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Al Smith is an artist who started his own advertising agency. Recently, Al rediscovered the joy of pencil drawing. He drew a portrait of a friend who was a veteran of the Vietnam War. After that, Al felt motivated to continue drawing soldiers and capturing vivid aspects of their experiences in the face of war. My name is Al Smith and I am a pencil artist and I specialize in military art. I've been drawing with a pencil since I was a young boy. I spent a lot of my time in my youth drawing pictures because I love to draw. That pencil drawing is my niche. I have done acrylic paints, a painting of uh, various subjects in acrylic paints, and I could do a very excellent job at those. As a matter of fact, I was a finalist in the Minnesota Duck Stamp Contest, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association Contest. Drawing with a pencil was quicker and faster, didn't need to wait for paint to dry, and I just loved it because I've been doing it all my life. A little while ago, I was thinking, I can't wait to get home because I want to start drawing because I just got some pencils today that I've been missing. <laughs> I chose to draw and portray 
military scenes, the Vietnam War, because uh, my good friend wanted me to draw a portrait of him, and he is a Vietnam veteran. I began to recall the many conversations that he and I had about his experience in combat in the jungles of Vietnam. And as a result, I got to understand him better. I don't do this all the time, but most of the time, whenever I'm doing something, I usually, I just say a little prayer. Hey, Lord, I'm gonna do this or that, or I'm going to be lecturing at some place, and I, you know, would you help me here? And I, it's not a complicated prayer, it's just a simple little prayer asking for help. As I began all these drawings, I said a prayer first. It was amazing, uh, the result of it. It's not theological and it's not long. I just, I just pray to, that the Lord would uh, combine my hand and my eyes and my mind together so that I could transfer the image that I'm looking at onto my paper. And then I also thank him for the picture that I have just completed and the talent he's given me. And that's about it. And I said, now let's get at it and let's draw this picture together. Something happened inside of me that I started drawing these pictures and portraying the Vietnam War. Not to glorify war, but to portray the soldiers and the aspects of their life in the face of war. And another reason is because I think things need to be said about the war. You mentioned the word Vietnam and it raises all kinds of opinions at it. And a lot of them are good and a lot of them are bad, but it was another war. It was a war in our history. And the people that fought it were just human beings, American boys, and they died and bled just like they did in all the other wars. But they didn't experience a homecoming like the others did because of the disdain and the anger and the hate that uh, a lot of the American people had for that war. And in war, as you all know, there's a lot of violent things that happened and unfortunate things that happened. And uh, a lot of these boys never got a homecoming. The bayonet on a man's rifle indicates that the enemy is close, very close proximity, and perhaps he's going to have to fight using that bayonet. Even though I have never been there and I have never been in, in active duty, I look forward to sharing the pictures, not for any glory, but to, just to show people what Vietnam really is like. Owatonna was first settled in 1853 around the Strait River in southeastern Minnesota. The population has grown steadily since that time. Owatonna features a healthy balance between making a living and what makes life worth living. We took a look at Owatonna's past, its present, and its future. Uh, some will recall a, a legend of Princess Owatonna, who they say was the daughter of Chief Wabina and Princess Owatonna was in poor health and Owatonna's Mineral Springs Park, as it's now named, had a bubbling uh, spring uh, which was very heavy in iron and it was said that she was restored to health then through drinking this water. That's the legend. Uh, the reason it's called Owatonna is actually because the Sioux who hunted in this area named the river Owatonna. And it, word Owatonna in Lakota Sioux means straight, so it is the straight river. Uh, the river is not straight, but the valley it created is straight. I'm Jerry Ganfield. I'm retired, but I'm a volunteer for several organizations, including the Steele County Historical Society. And it was a very agricultural state. Dairy was a big thing at, at, in the early days, where it is not a big item. Now I think we have fewer than 20 dairy farms in the county. But uh, one of the things that became prominent was we had two women, Emma McCrosty and Mina Holmes, who were farmers, farm wives. Um, they made butter, they made very good butter, and they entered competitions with butter and butter sculptures. 
and they won gold medals at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 and the Mid-Continent Exposition in Omaha in 1898, which brought attention to the quality of butter in Steele County. So it soon developed, we had 24 creameries in this county. We, we sold more premium butter than any other county in the state. And that's where we got the self-proclaimed title of butter capital of the world. I think a lot of the setters had a lot of courage and, and fortitude, and it was a time when they were inventing things to help improve life. And so we have a lot of industries that were started by private individuals who were working on a project. And a lot of the companies we have today were for many years private, family owned. Charles Buxton I was a John Deere dealer here in town one of our oldest, 1865, that was started. Mr. Buxton was at a convention in the cities of farm equipment dealers, and there was another meeting going on concerned about uh, in fire insurance because most farm equipment dealers, buildings were made out of wood, the equipment was made out of wood, very subject to fire. And by the end of the meeting, he was elected president. He sold his share of the partnership in the John Deere dealership to Mr. Wheelock, and he took over that Farmers Mutual Insurance Company, which later he moved to Owatonna and became Federated Insurance, which is probably our largest employer in town. Harry Wenger was the music teacher uh, at Owatonna High School, and he uh, wanted, saw the need for better chairs for uh, instrumentalists, and so he dabbled in creating music chairs designed for people with tubas and, and other larger instruments, and then he left teaching to found the Wenger Company, um, which specializes in that kind of thing as well, sound stages and, and uh, sound shells. I am Karen Pearson and I'm the Director of Tourism and Conventions here in Otana. We really have something for everybody. We have the, something for the adventure seekers, for the history buffs. It has some of the best trails, it has the Great Strait River, and the history and architecture is um, just something that you, you don't really expect in southern Minnesota. We were just recently um, voted one of the top 10 um, trails in Minnesota by Explore Minnesota. So there's the fat tire biking, cross country skiing, of course snowshoeing. Um, really people are you know, getting more and more active. We have a lot of offers for, um, for touring. We have the Orphanage Museum. Um, that's really unique and really get um, a feel for what it was like for those children. Some of them had great experiences, some of them did not. So um, you can also hear from actual orphans that lived there. The bank is also really cool if, if you like um, Frank Lloyd Wright's type of architecture. Um, Louis Sullivan was his teacher and so Louis Sullivan designed the Jewel Box Bank and it's just gorgeous. We have Cabela's. Um, and the Rad Zoo if you're into animals. So we really just have something for everyone. You now Oatana is located about uh, 65 miles south of Minneapolis, St. Paul on Interstate 35 and we're on the crossroads of Highway 14 between Rochester and Mankato. So uh, location, location, location. You know one of the things that we've had the privilege of doing years and years ago is the State Fair was located in Oatana for a couple of years and uh, now the county fair and it's the biggest county fair in the state of Minnesota. We've got about 300,000 people that come through the gates. There's a lot of vendors that bring in food booths. Uh, we got a great midway and uh, hopefully every year we hope that the weather is about 75 and sunny all week long. You know I've uh, had the privilege of being the mayor in my 13th year. Love Owatonna and uh, love to sell Owatonna. You know, my passion about Oatana is economic development, so anything that we can do to bring in more businesses and more jobs, that's my passion. Uh, we're very blessed in the whole gamut, from small businesses all the way up to uh, Bosch and uh, Federated and Vivercon and all the others. We've got a lot of good things going on downtown. You know, the bagel shop is uh, the best bagel shop in the state of Minnesota. It's got that recognition. We've got uh, a five-story uh, high apartment complex that's going in. We are very, very privileged to have the whole gamut. 
So it has you know, a lot of um, things for people to do, but yet it's um, tight enough that it has a great community, so it's super exciting. I've lived in seven places in uh, my career, and I think this town offers the most in the broadest sense that any I've lived in. It's just a great city with a great location. Jack and Kitty are very busy people. They are film and TV producers, as well as practicing and touring musicians. We were lucky enough to catch their performance at the Hormel Historic Home in Austin. Here they are performing their song, Get on the Train. All aboard! <laughs> Oh, 
We're near the end of this tour off 90. Thanks for riding along. See you next time. But before we go, here's a short piece about model railroading. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.